Good boy. Welcome back. Well, Benny's enjoying some time with me. Uh, some of you have asked, you know, where's Benny? And uh, I know I hadn't mentioned him in the last couple of videos, so you're concerned, and I, and I appreciate that a lot. But Benny's doing great. He's, uh, he's 10 years old. He, jo he, uh, he joined the ranks of the 10-year-olds back in uh, April, and uh, it's now three years since his cancer, the, the cancer he was supposed to die from, and the cancer we were supposed to put him down with. So uh, we're very blessed from... Uh, we're blessed that uh, he's still with us, and thanks to all your prayers, those of you who were with us at that time, you understand what we were going through. So, um, what we're going to talk about today is, uh, hi Benny, <laughs> he, he just loves being around here. Uh, this, is, this is one of his favorite rooms, you know. So, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the third chapter of the Elk series, which is um, Equipment. Now, some of you wondered why I didn't mention outerwear when I was talking about clothing. Well, uh, clothing can, is, is rather germane to, you know, almost any elk hunting. Uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, your base layer, you know, your underwear, and uh, layering uh, works no matter where you are, whether you're down in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, or up in uh, Kalispell, Montana, or the Bitterroots, or wherever you are, California, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, you, you still can layer and be very comfortable, whether it's cool in the morning, uh, or, or warm, or even hot in the, uh, in the middle of the day. And uh, then you can put the layers back on as it gets cooler during the day. So um, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's rather uh, generic for all of the uh, regions. So that's why I didn't mention uh, equipment, uh, I should say the outerwear, because I consider that really part of the equipment that's particular to a particular region that you might be hunting in. So I'm going to go back to the, what I mentioned in the first uh, episode and reiterate that it's very important to have good communications with your outfitter. And when I say good communication, be careful who you're speaking with. Because you may be speaking with a secretary uh, in, in New York City who's simply answering phone calls and, and, and answering questions off of a sheet that they gave her or him and, uh, you know, has no particular knowledge, you know, hands-on knowledge of uh, the actual hunting environment they're going to be going into. So you, you've, got to, you've got to get some sort of contact and uh, communication going with the actual outfit or the people who understand where you're going to be and what you're going to be doing. Uh, a, good, a good outfitter will have somebody uh, that you can speak to regarding that stuff because it's so very vital. They, they don't want to have, they don't want to have a, a trip uh, go sour on you uh, because you didn't show up appropriately clothed or equipped. So there's usually somebody in a good outfit that will give you that information. Now, well, first of all, so You see this? I love this. I love this right here. This is my, this is my uh, 45, and I got this nice uh, World War One style holster, and uh, with the leg strap. And I've got my Army K bar. Yes, Army. It's not just Marines. It wasn't just the jarheads that you know carried these. And I got my K bar and all that. I don't take that elk hunting. Absolutely, do not take that elk hunting. You, you, this, uh, you don't need this stuff. Um, and um, also, too, my, my trusty uh, 44 Magnum. I'm going rifle hunting. I don't need to bring this. I don't need to bring this along. It weighs me down. Um, for those of you who are old enough to remember, uh, there, was a, there was a movie called Treasure of the Sierra Madre with uh, Walter Houston and... Uh, Humphrey Bogart, and one of the last one of the last scenes, Humphrey Bogart, he he was kind of a scoundrel. He was uh, he was absolutely no good, and um, he had uh, stolen uh, bags of gold that he had strapped around his waist. And as he's he's trying to survive, getting back to camp and back to civilization, so uh, he kept dropping his precious bags of gold off as he went along. He just couldn't carry the weight. Well, you're gonna feel like you're gonna feel like Humphrey Bogart in that scene if you're carrying too much weight with you, and it's not gonna take it's not gonna take the end of the day. You're gonna be you're gonna be feeling like that about an hour into it. So, 
be very careful and understand that you again are going to be at high altitude in virtually all elk country. So uh, pack, you know, pack very, very uh, prudently. Uh, you're not going to need a handgun. Um, you, you, there's no reason to have a handgun whatsoever. You're going to have your high-powered rifle with you if you're on a high-powered rifle hunt. If you're on a handgun hunt, that's quite another thing. Or if you're on an archery hunt, that's quite another thing. But you're not going to be in many states. You're not going to be permitted to have any firearm if you're in a you know uh, archery uh, hunt. So let's talk about some basic equipment. Uh, I've been I've been using this bag for a long time. This is a uh, this is a this is a day pack. It's a larger than average day pack. It's, uh, you can carry an awful lot of stuff in here, and um, it's, it's, more than enough for, it's more than enough for anybody who's going on an elk hunt. Um, this, is, uh, this is a bag. It's got, it's got some pouches on the outside. You can put, you can put a water bottle in those uh, each side if you want, because you want to be absolutely sure you bring water with you. You're going you know, to get dehydrated very, very quickly as you expel moisture in those altitudes. Uh, and it's got, it's got a nice pouch on the front. The inside has got plenty of room to put clothing during the day. And, and, be, and be very wary about how you pack this because uh, you don't want to fill it up in the, in the beginning of the day and go out completely filled up with uh, stuff because you're not going to have a place to put your clothes later on. So what's in it? Well, first of all, I got a pair of gaiters. You don't hear too much about gaiters, but it's a nice thing to have no matter where you are, especially if you're, you know, in in any region where you're going to be picking up uh, snow in your boots, uh, or or even dirt and and sand or anything like that, rocks. You'll keep it out of the cuff of your boots. It also gives you a little bit of extra protection against, uh, you know, snakes if you happen to be in a snake region. So uh, these are good to have, and and you can. You can pack these uh, very neatly in your in your duffel and put them on at the beginning of the day, and they don't wear you down. They're very very light, so that's that's an essential thing to have. Um, another thing to have is I like to have I like to have with me a uh, just a three and a half inch bladed knife. I've had this one for a great many years. I think I got this in the uh, I think I got this in the early 80s, but this is a this is a uh, very nice uh, buck knife, and that goes with me anywhere. And it's 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 plenty big enough. Uh, you're not gonna, as I mentioned in in the uh, other video, you you're not gonna be able to uh, dress your elk if you're going on a guided hunt because that's one of the things that the the outfitters uh, require is that the guide has to do that. That's part of the service that they provide. It's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a good idea to think about uh, whether you need to have a uh, spotting scope. This one here, I, I used on my elk hunt. Uh, I, I should say I, I brought it with me, but I never used it because the, it turned out that the guide had an, uh, a spotting scope. He had one mounted on a, uh, on an old uh, rifle stock, so he could just put it up to his shoulder and, and uh, take a look at things. Uh, and that's, but you know, that's, it's not necessary to have a spotting scope. These aren't light. This one here is a small one. It's probably not the best resolution because it's only about, I think, a, a 50 millimeter lens. A good spotting scope is going to have a, a 60 millimeter lens if you're going to have decent resolution. And those start getting very heavy and, and bulky. Also, too, um, it's, it's difficult. This one here has a straight through viewing. Uh, it's it's a poro prism design. Uh, poro prism means that uh, it's got it's got two prisms in here that uh, basically upright. They 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 place the image in an upright position instead of it being upside down. Uh, two poro prisms together make the old style poro prism binoculars. Um, most a lot of your binoculars today are roof prism design. But anyway, I digress. Uh, you want to you want to be careful not to get a spotting scope that has an angled uh, eyepiece because that angled eyepiece is very very difficult to to align with your align with uh, wild game. That's perfect for for setting up you know on a tripod when you're looking at a target or something like that, and you can kind of find find things as they are. But something like this, 
you know, you can you can look very quickly. And um, a lot of spotting scopes today have a very good uh, variable, uh, you know, variable power. Uh, in, in in the old days, this this spotting scope did not it did not have a uh, power per se. Um, it, it the manufacturer marked it on the bottom here with 25 power because that was the eyepiece that they happened to put on. But the eyepiece itself was simply a uh, it's a number 96 Keller uh, made by, uh, you know, by, made by Keller. It's a Celestron. It's a 16 millimeter. So uh, it, a 16 millimeter lens just happens to come out to uh, 25 power. Um, that's a little bit much. That's a little bit difficult to hold. I, I would prefer, I have another lens for this that's a, uh, I think it's a uh, 18 power. And that's a little bit more. Uh, more handy to uh, uh, to spot things with. Let me just talk about that a little bit um, and the need for it. Most importantly, have a pair of binoculars. I didn't have a pair of binoculars in that bag right now. Um, never, never use your your rifle telescope to scan the horizon to to look for game because you know someday you're going to be looking at somebody and he's going to he's he's going to be looking back at you and uh, people are going to get mad uh, you don't want to be you don't want to be scanning for game using a rifle scope because as you remember you're pointing you're pointing a deadly uh, weapon in that direction so uh, you should and plus it's not a, it's not an efficient way of uh, looking for game they don't they're not made to have wide field of view you want a pair of binoculars that you can use both eyes and have good depth of field. So, uh, because that's what that's what a spotting scope and your and your telescope on your rifle lacks. They they have no depth of field. All they have is just one plane. Uh, and we're we're born with we're born with uh, two eyes to give us that depth of field, so we can uh, in, get a three dimensional image. The type of binoculars that you choose uh, is is really important. Um, Binoculars, as you've probably noticed, are extremely expensive. You can you can easily spend well in excess of a thousand dollars on a pair of binoculars. I'll say say this is probably not necessary. The primary use for a pair of binoculars is to locate uh, game. It's it's that's that's all it's for is to is to locate and isolate where game is. Uh, and they they they're best for just simply scanning, you know, every now and then, and scan you scan in in layers. In other words, as you're looking, first you look at uh, 50 yards away, then at 100 yards away, and you're overlapping the whole way until eventually you get out, you know, to infinity, and you're looking as far as you can. Um, but you, you're always you're always scanning with binoculars just to locate game. It's not. It, it, Resolution is extremely important. You have to have good resolution in order to determine whether whether something is a you know an elk, or whether it's a uh, mossy rock off in the distance. Is it you know because elk are not easy to see. Uh, God did a very good job of camouflaging all his game, and elk is one of the most difficult uh, game to see. When they're not when they're just standing there or just you know lazily feeding, uh, they they don't. They don't stand right out there unless that you know if if you happen to see them out in a grassy meadow, that's quite another thing. But they they know their backdrop. They like to they like to stay with with the wooded backdrop behind them, and they blend right into that. And it's very difficult to see them when they're beyond a couple of hundred yards. So uh, you need to have good resolutions, and, and resolution comes with a lot of money. I think that one of the best I think one of the best bargains uh, out there is has always been Steiner binoculars. They're extremely high grade binoculars. Um, the state of New Hampshire, as far as I know, and in, in the state of Maine, they use Steiner binoculars for the uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service for the for the fishing game uh, and game wardens. Uh, they're very good. They 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 have good resolution. Uh, they're not particularly expensive. You can get some good good Steiners for about three hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, and naturally, the the next, th well, those are poro prism. Generally speaking, they do make some they do make some roof prism binoculars. Now, those are the ones that basically straight shanked. 
uh, it looks as if you're looking straight through the straight through the lens. You're not really, but uh, you look at it looks as if you're looking straight through the lens. Roof prism binoculars are more money, um, but uh, the Steiner binoculars. I I had Steiners on my last hunt. I had seven by fifties. They were very bulky, but I'm you know I'm not I'm not a small guy, so uh, they they packed easily underneath my coat. And when I needed them, I I had them right there, and I was able to look. Um, seven power and eight power are very good for for general scanning for game. You don't need to have anything greater than that you're probably going to be handicapped by having anything greater than 8 power because uh, you, you're not going to be able to really get a good still hold. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the motionless uh, binoculars are not going to give you the same resolution. Uh, I, I mean, I suppose you can probably spend, you know, three, four thousand dollars and get something made by, a, you know, a big German name or Austrian or something. But uh, it, you don't need to have that. All you need to have is seven or eight power binoculars that have good field of view. And there's a, there's a general ratio that goes along with binoculars. It's, a, it's an ancient ratio that uh, all binoculars had uh, through the years. And it's based on, it's based on a ratio of five, uh, five to one. So in other words, if you have, if you have seven power binoculars, the, that ratio is 35. So seven by 35 was your classic uh, poro prism or roof prism binocular. Um, then going up is eight by 40s and 10 by 50. So it's always, it's, it's always that ratio of five. That's your classic uh, ratio that gives you the best, uh, the best uh, light uh, gathering ability. It, binoculars really don't gather light. You can't gather light and put it in a box and let it illuminate. You know, it doesn't. It doesn't stay in there. Um, it's it's kind of a term that has become uh, associated with it and it's used frequently. But light, binoculars really don't gather light. What they do is uh, they they simply allow more light to come in from surrounding areas. In other words, the, they allow more skylight to come in. If you look down, if you look down the barrel of your rifle, you'll see what I mean. It, there's nothing down there except blackness. You can't because it does at the end. There's it's not it's not big enough for light to come in. So uh, you know if you look down if you look down a paper towel tube, uh, you'll see that there's you can see very very readily because uh, is there's more light coming in. So that ratio has always been relatively the same through the years. Is is uh, based on five. Can you get uh, binoculars that are compact that have a, a smaller ratio like can you get you know eight eight by thirties and things like that yes you can but you're going to suffer a little bit when it comes to uh, looking into those places where it's so very important to see which that's what the whole point of having the binoculars is is to be able to look into those darker shadows along the wood line uh, you know you got a meadow that goes up to a, a wood line and that's where binoculars are challenged because you've got all this brightness with the grass and then suddenly you've got that darkness with the with the woods behind it where it goes up into the uh, mountains and that and that's an area where it's difficult for uh, smaller and less expensive binoculars to see you need to have you need to have binoculars with good resolution that can peer into those woods and that's sometimes where the uh, the elk will be uh, standing is along that edge or maybe a couple of trees in. So um, I do recommend. I, I think I think that eight by forties, like I think Zeiss makes uh, eight by forty threes or something like that. Those are a, those are a roof prism design. They're 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 about a thousand dollars. Steiner makes uh, seven by you know seven by thirty fives, and uh, they even make a seven by. Like I say, I carried a seven by fifty. They were a marine a marine binocular marginally more uh, what you call light gathering just just marginally so it, I wouldn't say that it was worth the uh, extra bulk that I carried around um, but that's that's a good thing to have that's what you want to locate your game with once you've located your game then if you if you're a trophy, trophy hunter you're going to have to uh, determine if that's the if that's the head that you want to go after not everybody is a trophy hunter some people are just looking for a nice bowl an adequate bowl of size. There's a general rule of thumb that you can keep in mind. As you're watching as you're watching a bull, 
when he puts his head down, see where his, the, the tips of his antlers are in relation to his shoulders. If, if his nose is on the ground and his antlers come up to or beyond his shoulders, he's got a pretty sizable rack. He's got, uh, you know, you can't say whether it's a Boone and Crockett rack or not until you actually measure it with, uh, you know, a more uh, powerful um, spotting scope. But you can get a very good idea that at least he's a, uh, a, a that's a that's a pretty good size uh, elk if if his antlers come up beyond his shoulders or to his shoulders when his head is actually on the ground. Um, you're not going to be able to see if he's a a, a a royal flush or anything like that until you get uh, up closer uh, and you know can examine him with a, a spotting scope maybe. But those are all things you can investigate that stuff uh, to your, you know, till the uh, to your heart's content. But be very careful to uh, get just good stuff. Don't don't be baited into buying uh, binoculars just because they're inexpensive. Because they're just not going to serve you well. They're not going to do what they're intended to do. You're probably going to have to spend at least uh, at least two hundred and eighty to three hundred dollars in order to get binoculars that are sufficient for the job. And don't get too compact a pair of binoculars because they're really not going to help you out either. You need to have you need to have at least that ratio of five or more. Okay, so we're moving on. What else do I have in my bag that's a basic item? This I consider to be this. This is my I I I, I carry this uh, wherever I go hunting. Um, I sometimes will start out with this on my layered clothing in the morning. Um, this here is a, a Gore-Tex lined shell. Uh, it's very lightweight. It's got, it's got kind of a net fabric inside and it's, it's like that, it's, it's like that uh, backpack. It's, it's a, like a flannel material, absolutely silent flannel material. Uh, and it, is, it zips up. It's got a, uh, it's got a hood with a uh, stiffened uh, brim and it has an adjusting strap on the back, so that that's that's kind of an important thing. You want you don't want to have your your hood constantly in your eyes. You want to be able to pull that back so that it keeps it back behind your hat. So this this here weighs only about uh, two pounds, and I can roll that up really tight and stick that in my stick that in my uh, backpack. That is I, I've worn this when it's uh, 15 below in New Hampshire with the other clothes that I have, the other clothing that I have layered. Uh, I don't, I really don't need anything more than this. This, I, this was, this was on my elk hunt with me. Uh, I don't need anything more than this when I'm uh, hunting, because remember I'm, I'm layering and that, those layers create uh, air pockets that keep you warm. Uh, and so I really don't need anything more than that. Uh, this, this technological clothing that you can get uh, you know that's that's all in one that you can put on that will give you uh, a much you know a, a much easier to address garb. You just simply put the coat on and you're warm. But I like to layer, and this is this is the way I go. So this here will roll up uh, toward the middle of the day as it gets warmer, and I can I can stick this in my backpack, and I'm good to go. It doesn't weigh anything. It's just it's just a two pound. Uh, I think I got that originally from Cabela's or something, but they're made by a, a, you know you can also get them from um, uh, Bass Pro, which is all the same company now. This it's a it's a good good item to have, and I think that's that's my choice. That's my option uh, for for dressing both warm and dry. That's that's waterproof, windproof, soundproof. It's got it all, and I put that on top of things, and it's not bulky, so I can wear that anywhere. Bring yourself a good rope. You know, six or eight feet of rope. Uh, this this is just a, a quarter inch quarter inch nylon rope. Why do you need a rope? I have no clue, but you'll know when you need it. <laughs> I guarantee. I've used I've used rope many many times. Uh, it's just a nice thing to have. Sometimes a guide will say, "Hey, have you got a piece of rope with you?" Because he's trying to he, he's he's trying to maybe tie up the tie up the elk so, so that uh, he can tie him into. We had to tie up my uh, brother-in-law's uh, elk when we, uh, I shouldn't say I did it. It was, uh, it was already done when I got up there. Uh, we got a radio call. He was uh, at about uh, 10,500 feet. 
up in a blizzard. And uh, so we got a radio call to go up and get him. I had already gotten my elk, I think, the day before or two days before or something down below. And uh, so we took a Polaris up there, and four of us got on, the two guides and, and two of us got on this Polaris together. It was, I mean, it was a comedy, you know, it was, it, was, it was like Keystone Cops. So four of us got on this one Polaris, and by the way, it hardly had any gas. It was reading, it was reading almost empty before we even got on the thing, but, you know, the, my, guide had, my guide had forgotten to bring his can of gas that he was supposed to bring with him, so I, th I, think, he was in, I think he was in trouble with the outfit of, later on with the the senior guide so uh we got up there and we had a hard time finding the elk at first because the blizzard had completely covered him over but fortunately the uh the guide knew better he he had he had orange ribbons tied to the antlers so you know often he was scanning with he's scanning this alpine meadow with his glasses and when i say an alpine meadow this is a big expanse it, it was probably 500 acres. It was huge. It was, it was all, all grass covered with snow, with, with two feet of snow, but, uh, you know, surrounded by woods. And uh, so that, my, my brother-in-law had shot it from the wood line. And um, so he had, we had a while. We had, to, we had to drive around for 10 minutes before we could find it. And uh, the guide finally located it by scanning with his binoculars. He could see those ribbons blowing in the, in the, in the uh, blizzard. So when we got there, uh, the, the guide had the elk tied in a donut because he knew it was going to take on rigor mortis and they needed to be able to get it. We needed to be able to get it into the back of that Polaris. So um, he had that cinched up and hogtied so that it wouldn't uh, just sprawl out and be uh, completely unmovable. So believe it or not, we all, all four of us managed to somehow get that that huge monster elk into that the back of that little Polaris, and I sat on the I sat on the elk going back down, with holding on to my brother-in-law's uh, shoulders, and my brother-in-law was holding on to behind the seat, and he was holding on to his guide, and the guy and my my guide was sitting on the handlebars riding down. <laughs> it was the funniest thing in the world, and somehow we managed to get through two feet of snow with all this weight, and it was way beyond the capacity of this. Polaris, but it, it gave testimony to what you can actually do with these stupid things. But, um, and, and an aside, about, uh, I think probably about 100 yards along, as we're bouncing along, um, <laughs> I feel suddenly very, very warm in places I wasn't supposed to feel warm. And, and I looked down and my, my, all my trousers, I mean, it was, I had blood gushing up it was like a geyser gushing up between my legs and it was i was sitting right on his 338 winchester bullet hole so i was getting i was getting saturated with hot blood and uh oh it was it was a mess but anyway we had a great time um so have some rope with you the other thing you want to have with you what's this well you need it trust me you want to have that with you bring some uh bring some heavy Bring some heavy uh, nitrile gloves with you. They're just good to have. You might need to help your guide out uh, with the with the uh, gutting process. So and and have a have a flashlight and have of course you have one that works. This one here, this one here. I haven't changed the battery for quite a while, but have a flashlight with you. You might you might just need it. Uh, you know for. Uh, Getting back to your getting back to your vehicle at the end of the day or something, so that's a good thing to have. Um, let's go into the pockets now. What else have I got? And again, I, I've got plenty of room in here in this bag. When I when I pack it up, uh, I have I have plenty of room to take uh, three or more extra shirts with me. I can I can throw my lunch in here. I can throw plenty of water. Um, have some have some spear ammo with you. Uh, you know, if you're a good if you're a good elk hunter, you should only need uh, one or two shots. But uh, a very very uh, dear friend of mine made this uh, ammo pouch for me, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be using it this year, I guess, because uh, I wanna I wanna use that. It's a really nice handmade leather pouch. Um, I've mentioned in a separate video about my favorite. Uh, I think it's the best rifle sling ever made and who would know any better than the US military this is a uh, M1 Garand sling uh, that's that's my go-to sling uh, it, it's 
this, this sling here uh, will not slip off your shoulder. Don't get the nylon kind. Uh, you want to have the cotton, one and a quarter inch uh, cotton sling. And uh, it acts as a good shooter sling, but it also acts as a very, very good carry sling. And watch my video about this sling because I give some important tips on it. And this thing is clack clacking around here. This is this is to go on the Garand and to go on the uh, uh, M1A. That's not that's not how you mount this to a sporter rifle. But that's the that's the sling you want to have. Forget those Cobra slings. They're just uh, they're just not worth it. They, they're not that comfortable, and they won't be able to give you the service you need. A space blanket. This one here actually saved a woman's life back in the, uh, I've been carrying it ever since uh, about 1972. I was going on a deer hunt with my dad and a friend uh, early one morning and uh, on the way we ran, we basically came across a, a woman who was off the road with her car. She had been off the road for about four hours. She was coming home that night from work and um, ran off the road in a snowstorm and the poor woman was there for about four and a half hours when we found her but i use i unpacked this uh this particular space blanket that day that morning and wrapped her up in in that until the uh, ambulance and the emts could get there and um and, and get her out uh, she was a very big woman but so i managed to i made that kept her warm though so it's just a foil uh, I repacked it, but a, a foil space blanket. I don't think that weighs. I don't think that weighs an ounce. Uh, very good thing to have with you because if you if you are cold, you can uh, wrap yourself in that. Um, this is a nice thing to have. Uh, this 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 is not what I typically clean my rifle with because there's more efficient means to do it, as I've demonstrated in other videos. But this is a this is a uh, Otis gun cleaning kit with a with a cable uh, with a cable rod and that cable will uh, push that'll push an obstruction out so if you happen to you know stick your barrel on, uh, accidentally into the mud or something uh, that will allow you to uh, retrieve it very nicely without any difficulty so have have a um, have a notice cleaning rod with you oh, let's see well, there's my old ammo. There's my old ammo pouch. I'll be replacing it with my buddies. And uh, more. Oh, this is my this is my uh, little deer bag. I've got another thing to want to consider bringing. If you like liver, I like the heart and liver. You know, I know it's not healthy for you, but I like the heart and liver. So I bring myself a uh, a, a a bag. Basically, I can put it in. It's just a. It's just a. Uh, a kitchen garbage bag basically and I can put the heart and liver in there and uh, keep that keep that nice and uh, fresh and uh, also too uh, a piece of a piece of uh, good stout string you know butcher string and you, you might need that to uh, affix your game tag to uh, according to law there's also inside there a, a pen a working pen and pencil or a pencil and, and uh, uh, paper so that's that's a good thing to have. Um, I think that's about that's about it for this this sort of stuff right here. That's that's your that's your. Uh, oh, and also features fe certain features that a good backpack should have. Uh, you know, I, I'm very I'm very particular about certain things. Make sure that it it has good padded uh, good padded shoulder straps. You want you, you really want to have a uh, handle because you want to pick this up and be able to hang it on a tree or something uh, to get it out of the way if you're sitting for lunch. Um, have make sure that it has a chest strap. You know, a lot of a lot of day packs don't have a chest strap. They just have they just have the shoulder straps, and that's going to keep on sliding down off your shoulders and it's going to be a nuisance. So make sure it has a chest strap to secure across the front. And also make sure that it has a waist strap, so that you can snug it up around your around your belt line, so that it doesn't keep on falling backwards onto your, uh, you know, off your back. So that that supports it. That's what that's what's important about any uh, good day pack. Um, if you're if you're packing if you're packing your game out, that's quite another matter. Now you're gonna you're gonna be talking about 
uh, doing some serious working out with um, with a pack frame uh, loaded with, you know, perhaps loaded with a couple of bags of concrete and do some just walking around with, with bags of concrete on your, on your pack frame, uh, learning to get used to uh, that weight. Because you're gonna, if, if, you're packing, if you're packing out your game, that's an entirely different uh, thing altogether. And I'm, I'm, frankly, I'm not into that. It's just it's a little bit more than uh, I ever wanted to bother with. Then the other thing is, and that's something that that's something that John Cleveland is very much into. So uh, he's the expert in that. If you're interested in, in packing a game out, uh, that's the that's the guy to read. And also, to a good a good day pack will have a provision for putting straps at different places to secure items that won't fit inside. So you know, if you if you have a if you have a big coat, for instance, that you wore, and you want to bundle that up, make sure you have some straps uh, that you can. Uh, roll that big coat up in and, and hang it from the bottom of your uh, bag. Uh, anything like that that's very important. It will also hold, it'll also hold a, uh, a shelter, you know, so you can, if, if you need to carry an emergency shelter with you, that's a, that's a good thing to have there too. Um, there's a place to carry, you know, there's a loop here to uh, slip a, a, a staff in. Uh, it's got it's got straps around the front just to secure things so that they don't bang around if it, when it's not fully loaded. So I can I can cinch this up really nice and tight so that it it, it secures it so it's not rattling around and, and the sh the shifting of weight. So that's enough of that. All right. A great many states now require a certain number of square inches of, uh, you know, blaze orange, cam uh, blaze orange, or at least blaze orange camo. So make sure you satisfy the state requirements wherever you're going. Check that out very carefully before you go. Uh, on my, on my uh, vest, I have this, uh, you know, I have this compass right here. Uh, this is a really nice compass. I mean, this is this. They don't all have, there's some, there's some imitations out there that are, uh, you know, imports that do not have this solid uh, safety pin. This, this safety pin is really solid. I couldn't pull this off if I wanted to. So uh, you want to get one that's uh, solidly mounted, but a, a good ball compass like that is nice to have. I know, you get your, I know you get your cell phone and all that, but you're not going to be walking around looking at your cell phone. Uh, and your GPS. You, that you, you want to be able to do it the old way. Just look down, maybe get your bearing from your GPS or your cell phone. Once you do that, then assign a bearing on your compass and head in that direction. Then all you have to do is just peek down at that every now and then. And you know, I'll, I'll talk someday about um, how to use a compass in the woods because Everybody should at least have at least have a compass like this, and I prefer to always have two compasses with me. I like to have a good uh, navigational compass, which is you know got a lanyard and it goes around my neck, and I can really take you know uh, it's a lensatic compass, so it has it has a, a stadia wires that I can take bearings off of trees or off of mountain tops or something like that. So. Learn to use a compass. Uh, it, it never hurts to uh, know exactly where you are uh, the old-fashioned way because, you know, in the event that your battery goes dead on your electronic device or whatever. Um, let, me talk about, let me talk about that business about camo and everything. I, <laughs> I have a lot of camo stuff, but, you know, it surprised me when I first started going and visiting outfitters when I get out there, the, the guide would meet me in the morning after breakfast, and uh, we'd go out, and I, I'm looking at him, saying, "Geez, I wonder when he's going to put his camo on," you know. And he never put his camo on. Um, I've yet, I've, I've gone out with, I've gone out with a number of guides, and I've seen the guides that my my brother-in-law went out with, and my dad has gone out with, and my wife has gone out with. Nobody ever wore camo. The the guides don't wear camo now. Maybe some of them do these days. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's uh, maybe it's something that they they're picking up culturally. But uh, they never wore camo. They usually just wore denims. They they wore jeans and uh, cowboy boots. I mean, you'd be surprised with with their the the, the heels are you know worn down to 45 degrees and everything else. But I mean, these guys have been in the woods all their life and they don't care. But to them. They, it's all about scent. As long as you can control your scent, 
and your movement, it doesn't, to them, they didn't care what they, what they wore for color because, you know, they, they didn't think that, uh, and I mean, it, it proved it, we always got our game. But they didn't think it had anything to do with what you looked like as long as you didn't move around and as long as you didn't stink. Those were the two things that were important. Never move against the horizon, always move in this direction because moving in this direction, uh, you know, you're, you're not seen as easily. When you move this way, you're seen very quickly. We learned that in the Army in basic training. And the other thing is to not smell. And that's, that's again, something which you always have to control your scent. So aside from that, whether, whether camo is important or not, I just don't know. And I'm not, I'm not entirely convinced having seen what I see out there. Um, and, uh, you know, most of, the, most of the elk were exterminated from the United States of America uh, before the 20th century. And nobody wore camo in those days. They wore, they wore whatever they wore. So don't be don't be afraid of wearing the orange the blaze orange is required by law because uh, the most important thing is is to uh, pay attention to uh, the basic rules of the road as they say movement and scent and avoiding silhouetting yourself against the sky i've worn this on a couple of occasions it's it's you know in fair weather this is a this this is a good garment for just uh Wearing in the beginning of the day, uh, it's it's got a flannel lining inside. It's it's uh, basically it's a denim type of material, and I can I can wear that comfortably. That's that's an option if you're in uh, more temperate regions. Uh, through the years, I've had several different down vests. Down vests are very very practical. They you can you can unbutton them or unzip unzip them, and uh, they'll give you plenty of warmth. This one happens to have a uh, high collar. I've also had just, uh, you know, the, the, the cotton, the, uh, not the cotton, but the stretch, uh, the stretch um, fabric, and that works, that works too. And this one here is a little bit more coverage than some vests have. Some of them actually have a cutaway front. So, you know, anything, that's, anything that might help you retain a little bit of, uh, you know, body warmth during the day. Uh, if you have down, always remember the down has uh, one particular failing, and that is that uh, the once the down starts getting wet from perspiration uh, or from rain, uh, it's going to compress and then it has no value whatsoever. So, um, you know, make sure that make sure that you understand that. And if and if you have the ability to let it dry out uh, in the evening, if you're going to wear it during the day, make sure you do that. Even if you're just wearing it and there's no rain, it, your own perspiration has soaked it. So, but a, a down vest is something to think about having if you're in a cooler area. Now here's a traditionalist garment right here, and I still wear this. I mean, I, I kind of like this. I've worn this coat, this one here I've had for, I don't know, I've had this one for, well, I, I gained a little bit of weight, so this is not my original, but, um, and now I've lost weight, so I, I probably go back to my original, but I don't have it anymore. But this here is the old Woolrich Storm Coat. This is the classic. This is the classic coat. Filson also makes one that's very similar. It's got the big, big. It's got the big, big patch pockets on it. The buffalo plaid. Uh, it's got a kind of a heavy, almost almost a uh, very very heavy uh, flannel. It's almost like a canvas flannel inside. Uh, these things are bulletproof almost. Don't try to shoot it with a bullet, but. And, and they're, they're, it, it has a lining. I don't know what kind of lining it is, but it has a lining in it. These are very, very warm. And it's got this uh, storm collar that, that goes up. This storm collar comes right up underneath your hat. So it, it gives you full coverage and it's got a, it's got a uh, flap that you can secure that storm collar right around your face. Uh, like I say, I've been, this is absolutely windproof. I've been out when it's uh, 20 below zero up in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, uh, with the snow howling, uh, and this has kept me absolutely warm. Um, it's uh, it, it weighs about it weighs about um, four and a half pounds, probably on average, uh, which isn't an awful lot heavier. Uh, I don't th I, I I compared the weights. It's only probably a half a pound heavier than the more technologically designed ones. Um, Buffalo plaid uh, is quite camouflaged in the woods. It's, you know, the old timers knew what they were doing. They, they, they couldn't, they couldn't uh, put 
camel on mills in those days, uh, but they could, they could make this type of fabric and they knew what they were doing. Just understand when you're wearing buffalo plaid that you look like a black bear walking through the woods in, at dusk. So uh, if you're in bear country, be very, very sure that uh, you keep do doing some uh, things that people know that you're not a bear. So here's a technologically advanced uh, Under Armour. Uh, this is, you know, I, I, collect, I collect garments, you know, I, I, I'm always trying out stuff. So this one here has got it all. This one here has got the, the silent fabric on the outside. It's got, uh, it's got the waterproof, it's got the waterproof zippers. Uh, it's got plenty of pockets inside and out. Um, it's uh, got a, it's got a hood with, it's got a hood with that uh, uh, strap in the back that I was talking about to uh, adjust it on the, on your head. Uh, it's got a it's got a stiff brim that can be pushed back if you want to. Um, it's Gore-Tex lined and it's got thinsulate. Uh, it's and it's got a place for your it's got a place if you, you just can't get away from your cell phone you got you got a place for your cell phone here. You know if you're going to some of these places if you're out in the Bitterroot Mountains don't be thinking about using the cell phone you might just you might just have to uh, uh, go through withdrawal but uh, you won't you won't be able to receive any signals out there. So, but that's an option. Um, I don't know if it, I don't know if it really keeps me any warmer uh, than my old Woolrich coat. Um, I don't know if it has any advantage over the old Woolrich coat, except it's more modern. And I still have to put an orange uh, vest on it in some states, not in New Hampshire, but in some states I still have to put orange on it. And if I'm, if I'm out hunting around, I, trust me, I still wear an orange vest because I, I don't, I don't trust everybody I see out there. And uh, here you go. This is my this is my snow garb. So if I happen to be out, if I happen to be out, uh, it's the same thing as uh, that Under Armour. This one here is made by. Uh, let's see, who is it made by? It has bone dry, which is um, oh, this is a redhead. This is a redhead made by, uh, this, this is marketed by uh, Bass Pro Shop. This, this is probably more, I, this is more comfortable than that Under Armour. It's, it's a softer material. Um, it's got bone dry in it instead of, uh, instead of, uh, what's, the, what's that waterproof stuff I was just mentioning? Well, uh, see, this is the trouble when you when you start getting old. So anyway, uh, and it's got a, it's got an inside pocket. This is a very comfortable thing, and it also comes with, as so many of these do, it comes with bib overalls. I'll tell you what. Uh, I mean, if I, if I were going, I, I'd never wear this. I would never wear this elk hunting. I'm, you know, this is this is maybe an option for those of you who are going after elk in extreme weather to have something like this along with you, uh, you you're probably not got, you know, your chances of actually wearing something like this are slim to none in most uh, seasons, but if you happen to be up in the northern climes and the higher regions, uh, this is an option. This is, these bib overalls combined with that coat, I mean, you can go literally with your, with nothing more than your skivvies on underneath this and you're gonna stay warm. Uh, and uh, yeah, that, that would be the thing to have if I were going um, polar bear hunting. So Gore-Tex, that's what I was trying to think of. So Bone Dry is the, that's, that's their brand name for uh, Gore-Tex, which is a patented name. So I think that's about it. We're gonna talk later on about uh, some important things I think you probably wanna uh, know about is uh, what about the elk? You know, how do you hunt this critter? So uh, that's, the next, that's the next episode. Don't forget to subscribe. Benny and I give our best, and so does my wife. God bless.